Hello, everyone. Uh, this presentation will be talking about uh, reproducibility in ecological niche modeling or species distribution modeling. I'm Xiao Feng. I'm currently transitioning from University of Arizona to Florida State University. So uh, I'm going to start with an example of myself about what is um, a less reproducible research. OK. Um, so when I was trying to, a few years ago, when I was trying to revisit a previous project, I was really think hard what I have done. For example, so I have a two folder with the exact same name, one in Dropbox, one in Google Drive. So I ask myself, which folder had the latest data? Okay, probably the Google Drive, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I have a number of Excel files in that folder with different names. So it looks like I have filtered my data in Excel. Okay, but I don't remember exactly what I have done. So also I have some shape files in my folder. So it looks like uh, I, have, I have done some data transformation in ArcGIS. I clicked some buttons, but I don't remember what I exactly clicked. Okay, um, I also have used Maxen, so, but I don't remember which option I have selected. Maybe I could find some clues from the Maxen output. Yeah, but all of those aspects can make our research less reproducible. Okay. So I believe that I'm not alone. I'm gonna show you a survey uh, recently conducted by Nature. So they uh, did a survey of over a thousand and 500 researchers. And they ask those researchers, can you reproduce your peer research? Or can you reproduce even your own research? So the answer is surprising. So more than 70% of the researchers were unable to reproduce research by others. And uh, well, importantly, surprisingly, approximately 50% of them cannot reproduce their own results. Okay, and here's the graph that shows more details of the results. And the, the results would uh, vary by discipline, but generally it's on average 70% and 50%. This is very surprising results. I think this is represent a, rep uh, a reproducibility crisis in science. We all know that scientific research builds on previous work. And we want the previous work to be solid it can be reproducible, it can be tested, it can be proven to be right or wrong. But if a research is not reproducible, that will definitely affect all the following work that tries to repeat it or cite it. And then I would say, I would think that the reproducibility is one of the fundamental basics in science. Without reproducibility, the science will be uh, dramatically effective. So ecological niche modeling or species distribution modeling is a really good example to look at this issue. Why? Because, uh, okay, as far as I know, over 33 algorithms had been applied to EMM or SDM. And also one of the data input for, for the species distribution modeling is environmental data. We know that there has been um, global-wide, country-wide, environmental monitoring networks. This is just a picture showing the NEON in US. And also we all know that the remote sensing data um, has greatly expanded. Our Earth has been monitored every day, every hour, every minute. And there has been a variety of remote sensing products that monitor our environment. Also, another important data input for a niche modeling is uh, species observational data. And in recent years, the digitalization and also aggregation of biodiversity data has greatly um, accelerated. On GBIF, there has been recently over a billion biodiversity records. And also this, this figure shows the data coverage from IDIGVAL that um, aggregate all the museum uh, specimen data. So we have a lot of those data. With all of that, we have seen um, witness thousands of publications related with EMM or SDM. Here the figure shows the number of publications related with EMM or SDM per year. You can see that 
Okay, last year there was over 5,000 publications on this topic. Also, this, this, the two set of EMM or SDM has been applied in a wider range of disciplines or research topics. So, EMM is greatly developed and broadly used. Well, are those studies reproducible? Well, to answer this question, um, colleagues and I uh, developed a, a checklist that tried to many, maximize the reproducibility of ecological niche models with um, Daniel Park from Harvard, uh, Ksenia Walker, Tom Peterson, Cora Merrill, and Monica Papesh. So this, we call this her EM checklist. It has um, mainly four major categories associated with uh, occurrences, environmental data, model calibration, and model transfer and evaluation. And here is um, a, a final resolution of this checklist. Each item is associated with each um, major categories. So I will uh, briefly pick a few items from this checklist and explain why that is important. So this is about the metadata of occurrences. I think it is important to report the source of current data, the download date or the version of the data source, the basis of the record, the spatial extent, and also the temporal range. So why does the download date or the version of the data source important? So here this figure shows the number of records that had been um, collected and digitalized, of, I guess, from a naturalist. We can see that so on the axis, x axis, it is year. So as time goes, there are more and more records being collected every day. So which means if we study um, downloaded data yesterday, that would have uh, less data than the data downloaded today. So that's why time is, is important because databases always change. So another thing I want to emphasize is the temporal range of occurrences is important. Why? That's because species distribution is always in a dynamic way. It's never statistic. It changes with the environment. It goes, it will change uh, as time goes. Here, this map shows the, the range dynamics of fair ant in US. It was originally introduced into this location, and then over time, it gradually expanded. So that means without knowing the exact temporal range, it will be difficult to, to know what kind of data would be included. And that would mean the final model would be um, greatly affected. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna just mention those two points about the metadata of occurrences. So next I wanna talk about the metadata of the environmental data. So obviously we want to report the source. We also want to report the download date, or the version of the data source, as well as the spatial resolution and temporal range. Okay, I want to give you a few examples about why the download date or the version of the data source is important. So many of you know that the World Claim data set is the global, global wide climatic data set. I've seen paper uh, reporting that, oh, okay, we used world claim data to model the species distributions. But that is probably okay like a few years ago, but not now because now we have two different versions of world claim. One is 1.5, sorry, one, one is 1.4, which is the original version of world claim. And recently they published world claim two. And obviously the two data sets are different without knowing which one is used, then it's impossible to reproduce a, a work, a scientific work. Okay, here's another example, the PRISP. It is um, about the climatic data in the US. They have different type of uh, climate product, and one is called the more recent e six months. If you read the um, explanation, it will say, that the data can change as new data becomes available because um, it is not about the actual observation, but it is all more based on 
interpolation of a lot of um, weather stations, and they're trying to get some stable results based on historical historical averages. So obviously, without knowing the date of the data, then it will be hard to reproduce our work. Another example is from remote sensing data. If many of you heard about the MODIS data, um, if you pay attention to the details of MODIS data, um, the MODIS product, they frequently conduct a quality assessment. And it is obviously um, easy to understand that when they do quality uh, assessments, they can find bugs, errors. And then they're gonna update and correct the data. Well, that means a, um, a data set before the data correction versus the data after the data correction would be different. So that's important for the, as the metadata. That's why the, the date or the word of the data source is an important aspect for the environmental data. Okay, next, I want to uh, talk about a few things in model calibration. So we, we distinguish this as data input versus something about the modeling algorithms. The data input includes the modeling domain, number of background data, if you're gonna use um, maximum modeling or other type of algorithms, and also a sampling method for selecting background data, also variable selection, then the name of the algorithm, the version of the algorithm, and also parameter parameterizations. So one thing on the inference side is the modeling domain, which essentially means the area that you are gonna conduct the, the model or the spatial area you're gonna conduct the model. Okay, why you want to report this? First, there are different options that you can, um, you can do about the modeling domain. Well, in the public literature, uh, there have been suggestions for using a species accessible area as the modeling domain. And also it's very common to use some political boundaries. It is also common to see people use ecological boundaries such as ecoregions or biomes. Um, it also has been done on, uh, in, in whole continents in some studies. So there's no default or best option. Not by, by using different domains that will also affect a few important things of, the, of, of your model. First, it will affect the selection of background points if you don't have true absences. Also, it can affect the model evaluation index. There has been a paper about AUC um, a few years ago um, I think one of the results is that if you are gonna use a broader modeling domain, say whole continents, you can easily get very, very high AUCs. But that may, or may not reflect how good the model is. Also, if you're gonna use a very, very small modeling domain, and then if you're gonna project your model to area around your study, your study, your modeling domain, you're gonna more likely to see model extrapolations, simply because your training data is pretty much limited to a, to a narrower range of environmental conditions. So another thing I wanna talk about is the variable selection. Without going too much uh, depth into the methodology, uh, I wanna pick one simple example. Maybe you have seen this in, in papers that when, when, when they have two variables that are highly correlated, they only pick one, okay? Is this reproducible? I don't think so, because when there are two variables, how you're gonna pick one versus the other one, you can do it randomly, or you can have some um, preferences, or you can have some, um, maybe there, when there are temperature and precipitation, precipitation, you could, you may want to prefer temperature for some, for some reasons, but without specifying how, then others would not be able to reproduce this variable selection procedure. Okay, another thing I want to emphasize is the, the version of the software. Um, one important reason is that the default settings 
could change in different uh, versions of the software. Here's one example, okay. In Maxim modeling, in the Maxim algorithm, the default uh, transformation tab was logistic in the versions 3.3 and also version before that. But in the version, uh, starting version 3.4, that transformation tab has changed to clockwise, so which is different. If, if there's no specification of the version of Maxine, then there's, it, there will be no clue about the transformation tab. Okay, another example, if you use R, if you use the raster package in R, there's a function called buffer. Buffer basically will build a buffer area, a spatial buffer area around the spatial points. Okay, there's a parameter called unit. The default unit was degree in some of the um, the the function in previous in a few years in the previous version, but in the more recent version, the default unit has has changed to meter, so that's a huge difference. Okay, next I want to um, talk about a few things in model evaluation and model transfer. So we um classified this into a few major categories. First, something about the model evaluation, then what, what procedure, what parameters are involved in modeling output. Also importantly, because model transfer is very, very common, there are a few uh, important aspects you want to pay attention to about the model extrapolations. And then when you are doing model transfer, you want to pay attention to the metadata of the environmental data sets that you are projecting a model to. But also to mention a few things. In, term, in terms of model evaluations, many people have used AUC because that's um, pretty much um, easy use index and um, you can get a unique value um, for, one, for one modeling um, scenario. And also AUC is threshold independent. At the same time, there are several other variables but uh, evaluation index that is threshold dependent, for example, the partial AUC or the PAUC. I have seen paper that report the PAUC value without specifying the threshold. And also the, another index is the true skill statistics and the commission error omission error. All of those are threshold dependent. You have to specify a threshold before you calculate that. So without knowing what threshold you are based on, then it will be hard to infer or assess the model performance. Okay, another thing, the threshold about the model output. Um, a lot of times the default output from a model prediction is in continuous format, say from zero to one, representing the relative probability of presence. And commonly, what people want is simply a binary map say presence or absence. That would mean you need a threshold to transform the continuous map into a binary map. And obviously, there can be automated ways to do this binary map. So without specifying which threshold was used, then it'll be hard to reproduce that binary map. Okay, in terms of model extrapolations, um, different algorithms can use different extrapolation strategies. And this extrapolation strategy can also be uh, manipulated by the, by the user. Here, this figure shows that different algorithms could um, extrapolate in different ways. For example, in uh, Maxen, it could, the default extrapolation strategy is called clamping. It basically will pick some minimum value along the edge and then, and then use that as a constant when for the area outside the training data. But the clamping could also be turned off. So without specifying uh, what is the extrapolation strategy, it, it, it will be hard to imagine what, how, how the model will predict outside the training data. And if you pay attention to the presentations previously that, uh, about model transfer or model transfer scenarios, you, you will remember that it can be at, uh, ultimate ways to do model extrapolation. 
So that's one important thing to specify to improve the model uh, reproducibility. And similarly, um, for the you want to report the source, the date, spatial temporal aspects of the environmental data that you're going to project the model to. Okay, back to the question. Ecological niche modeling has been greatly developed and broadly used, but are those thousands of studies reproducible? So we did a literature review. So we uh, downloaded 160 papers that are published in 2017 and 2018 from eight journals, including Global Ecology Biogeography, Journal of Biogeography, Diversity Distribution, and a few others. Here's what we found. On the x-axis is the, the percent of the items that are reported. The items are from the checklist I just mentioned. The y-axis is the, the number of papers that reports a particular percent of items. We can see that, okay, most of the papers report approximately 50% or 6% of the items. And the few papers that reproduce all of them, and also few papers reproduce little of them. Well, here's another way to look at the, the, the data. It shows the x-axis shows the percent of papers report a particular item from the checklist. So um, I want to, I want to um, briefly explain a few examples. So for example, the, the source of the current data is very, very commonly reported, but the date of the occurrence data or the version of the data source is less commonly reported. Another um, thing to mention that, okay, the source of the environment data, the environmental data is almost all reported but the download date or the version of the data source, for example, the version of the world claim, is less reported, only approximately 25%. And also, um, the spatial resolution is more, uh, more frequently reported than the temporal range. So this is about the training data. Well, interesting comparison is that when, when people are projecting the models, the temporal range is more commonly reported than the spatial aspect. Okay, another thing is the model evaluation index is, is, is almost all reported. However, the threshold for some of the evaluation index are less commonly reported, probably one out of three of the papers report that. Okay, so that's just the variety of things people have pay attention to. Obviously, some of the things like the modeling algorithm name has always been paid attention to. On the other side, um, something that are, has been less paid less attention to. Okay, here are the few lessons from the classical niche modeling publications. So reporting the use of default setting, it's better than not report anything. So I know that um, by, re by reviewing the papers, um, default setting has commonly been used, but some papers would never report the use, either the default or not. So that's why report the use of default is, is better than report nothing. Okay, um, another thing is the random could, be, could often be the default but it should not be inferred to be so. For example, when you are in terms of um, data separations or section or background points, yeah, I think default could be the common approach to do that, but there can also be many other ways to, to, do, to do it. So that's why it, random could be the default, but it should not be inferred to be so. Okay, and because the data and the code could change over time. So that's why report the date of the version is super important. So models can also be easily projected in space and time. So the modeler should really pay attention to the method and uncertainties that are um, involved in during model transfer. 
actually there have been multiple softwares developed in especially in our program environment that can help the the modeler to record the metadata as well as the details of the methodology so that would be a good way to improve the reproducibility of the modeling study so here's some a uh, few final remarks so to re to improve the reproducibility authors are recommended to report the metadata of the data the model the methods i think uh, importantly the philosophy of the ecological condition modeling checklist could be extended to many other fields here we have summarized this as the the data input the the model calibration and also model evaluation and the model transfer i believe those are um, commonly used standards in many other um, fields well, it's not only the, the author's duty, but also I believe it's the reviewers, editors, and journals, funding agents. They should all take actions to promote the reproducible science. So um, that's my talk. Um, it will it give you an um, overview about the ecological niche modeling checklist and how that can help us to maximize rep the reproducibility of ecological niche models. Um, feel free to email me or ask me any um, questions. Thank you very much.